All right, Mark chapter number four, we're down into verse 35. Uh, we missed last week uh, due to the week of the holiday, between the holiday and stuff. Um, and uh, so I want to go back into here with this uh, issue of uh, where the Lord calms the storm and just kind of massage that out a little bit here. I know we covered some of it. Uh, verse 35, in the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over to the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there were also with him other little ships. Uh, this account of uh, the calming of the sea, of the storm, is found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's one of the few accounts of, of activity that's in all three of the Gospels. The fourth Gospel, John, doesn't carry a lot of this because, again, John's goal is not the painting of the portrait here. John's goal of painting the Lord's portrait as who he is, the Son of God. Matthew groups things together, doesn't follow a chronological order. Mark follows the chronological order. Matthew, going to pick him as the king, Israel's king. So Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew is building a case, a court case, uh, a litigation to prove that he is the Messiah. Mark, going to paint that servant picture of him being the servant, says, here's the work schedule. Here's what we're doing. We're doing, if you've ever worked in a service type industry or anything where service is the issue, we're going to do A and then B and then C, then D, and guess what? We're going to start over again, A, B. So in Mark, you have more chronological order of the events in the life of Christ. And uh, Luke presents the Lord as a man, and he too is more chronological than, Matt, you know, where Matthew is a grouping. And really, if you take Matthew and Luke and pull out all of the discourse where the Lord's talking, it, those two books are literally, and John, are literally smaller than Mark because Mark doesn't carry a lot of the conversation. It's action, immediately is a, is a key word, and is a key word, and off we go. So here in Mark 4, we've been looking at the parable issue. We've seen the mustard seed. We've seen the sower. We've seen the issues of those that sower... Uh, being uh, defined for us. We have the two groups in Israel. The mustard seed comes along and says there's going to be great growth as he looks beyond Calvary at their Acts ministry. Uh, I was reading today back in Exodus where they lose 3,000 in one day. And in Acts 2, they're at, they're 3,000 is the number added to the little flock. So what they lost is added back when the confounding of the languages in Genesis 11 is corrected in Acts 2 with the gift of the Holy Spirit and the, speaking, the ability to speak in tongues. 5,000 will be there. 120 is the number of the priesthood, and, and yet there's 120 in the upper room. So you've got all of this similarity, and the mustard seed comes along and says, okay, look, there's, you're going to have great growth, and that gets to that 30, 60, and 100 and we've looked at that. Now we have this issue of the storm that's going to come. And the storm here is going to illustrate the carrying on of the ministry into the future. They're going to have to carry on with his, in his absence. And they also are going to have to deal with the opposition that's going to come then. And that's really what we're going to lead into chapter 5 come out of four and into five here, and that's because of he knows he's leaving. They don't know this yet. He's getting them prepared. So in, in verse 35, and the same day when the even was come, he said unto them, let us pass over unto the other side. What does he tell them? We're going to the other side. Now the other side, 5-1, and they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. So they're going to go, that's where they're headed. And when we get in here, in the, we're going to kind of introduce chapter 5, hopefully here in a little bit, but next week we'll get into the details of it. He is invading a region in Israel 
that has been a long-held strategic stronghold by the adversary, by the sons of Belial. And it's been this way since the very early days of Israel in the land. When they came out, and they're going to go into the land. So we're back into the day of the judges. We're back, we're back in the old, time, old history of Israel. They're ready to go in, and they send the 12 spies in, and two say yes, and 10 say no. So they got to leap, wait it out, and now they're going in. The, the issue here is there's, there's been a stronghold in that land. Joshua goes in. And he says, our, my generation has done the job. We've done our part. Well, the next generation dropped the ball. They didn't do their part. And that stronghold began to take in, and it's in the land of the Gadarenes. If you'll, and again, that's what's happening. And he's going to deliver, when we get over there, he's going to deliver the maniac. If you look down in 5, if you look there at chapter 5, if you look at verse 6, but when he saw Jesus afar off, he, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? And that's the issue, that title, the Son of the Most High God. And, and again, Genesis 14, the Most High God defines that as possessor of heaven and earth. So, verse 10, and he besought him much way that he would not send them away out of the country. He's going to go in. He's going to deal with the maniac. Uh, what well, he's called a maniac. He's not really a maniac. He, he's. I, I got a, this microphone. I was listening to a mark, and I noticed how low the volume was. So I've got a new mic ordered that sits up here on my head. I broke it down, and so let's get a new one. Let's get the right one, and then so as soon as it gets here. But meanwhile, this thing pokes and prods and then I grow a beard and it gets in the way and you know just might as well forget it you know <laughs> now you know why I'm frustrated Paul when you come in it's like been a day okay <laughs> anyway verse 10 so again the issue here is they're going to the other side they're going into the land of the Gadarenes the stronghold of the adversary and he's literally invading the territory so we see him go in he's going to go into this country, he's, uh, taking, he's going to take Israel, and he's and going to liberate Israel. Well, but first we have this storm, and the storm here is really painting the picture of what we're going to look in chapter 5 and 6 and following, because the storm here is he's, gonna, he's delivering the, na- the, the, the disciples, And then he's going to go over and he's going to deliver the nation, chapter 5 here, from the captivity of the adversary. And so there's two things here that's going to happen in this teaching. And one, it's the Most High. He's possessor of heaven and earth. He's doing that. But then he's also over here going to say, hey, little flock, this is now going to be your job when I leave. So look at 435. Let's get down there. 435. And the same day when the even was come, he saith unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. So let's go to the other side, guys. And we, we've got something to do over there. So he, we're going to go over there and we're going to take care of the satanic policy of evil. We're going to throw it out of the land of Israel. We're going to get that back. So we're going to attack the stronghold, the headquarters, if you will, of the adversary. And we're going to get it back. So at the very moment here he knows we're going over there now he's telling them something here we're going what we're going over there that's where we're going verse 36 and when they had sent away the multitude they took him even as he was in the ship and there were also with him other little ships he's had a long day he's been going he's tired as the son of god uh, isaiah says god doesn't get weary John says he's weary. So as his humanity aspect side of him, he's tired. He's exhausted. So they're going to leave. He's already told them, what's his word? We're going to the other side. So they get in the boat. Then these little boats, the multitude actually follows him. That's the little ships. They, They follow him. Verse 37. 
and there arose great, a great storm of wind and waves, beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the sh- ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? He's, he goes to sleep. Again, he's showing his humanity. He's exhausted. But it's also showing his confidence in the little flock. He has total and complete confidence that they will be able to get him, get the, him and themselves to the other side. He has confidence. He's comfortable. His head's asleep on a pillow. That's how comfortable he is. He's not, you know, worried. He's not half awake, half this. He's out like a light. So they go to the, he, he, he has confidence in them. And that's really what's, what they're going to miss here when we get down in verse 40. And he said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? <laughs> Okay, guys, you're not trusting my word. Verse 37, the storm kicks up. And the, weaves, the, waves, uh, the great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. In Luke 8, he says that it's full of water. Well, if you're out on the boat and the waves, I mean, I've been out in the Pacific Ocean, deep sea fishing, and the storm blows in, and the next thing you know, you're looking at waves over your head. It's a little dis you know, little little unnerving. Well, that's where they're at. He's asleep. They go and wake him up, verse 38. They're not really thinking about what's going on. They're not paying attention. You remember a couple weeks ago when we talked about the thing in Matthew 17 where they can't heal the guy and they couldn't heal him, they couldn't heal his servant, the kid, the, the, and it was because of, they weren't, fasting and praying and they weren't fasting and praying because they didn't understand they didn't keep up with the revelation that he's leaving them Matthew 60 he's leaving them he's going away he's going to die remember that please say yes please say yes thank you okay that's what they're they're not keeping up What what did he tell them verse 35 we're going to the other side they they get a little nervous they're not keeping up with what he's, they're not paying attention to what he said. They're not listening to his word. No matter, no matter what happens, where are they going? To the other side. And that's what verse 40 is. And he said unto them, why are you so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? And that's the issue. But what he's saying there is, look, guys, I mean, could, they got all this going on. Now, the storm is going to be a picture of the adversary coming up. We're going to see that here in just a second. So the opposition's come up to stop them from getting to the other side. What's the word of God say? We're going to the other side. They panic. Fear. Unbelief gets in there, not keeping up with the revelation, not keeping up with the program. So they run to him and say, hey, you know, don't you care? Well, of course he cares. But the thing is, is they're not paying attention. And that's the the teaching moment here. So in verse 38, well, verse 37, there arose a great storm of wind and the waves beat into the ship. Verse 39, and he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still, and the wind ceased, and there was great calm. Now, the storm, the wind, the wind has kicked up the waves. The wind has come, this is this great storm. Uh, come back with me to Isaiah 57. Isaiah 57. And just notice the, the issues here. Isaiah 57. And think about this issue of the storm and what's really kind of happening here. The issue of the storm, when, when you think about the storm coming up and the wind blowing and the waves raging and what he's going to do, Isaiah 57 and verse 19. By the way, in the Old Testament, this is historical narrative, okay? That's how, that's how the Old Testament is written. 
you write that way so that you teach children the object lesson, okay? God's always referred to Israel as children. How do children learn? They learn by watching, by seeing events, okay? They, they pay attention to things. It, it's, very, I, it's very interesting to watch the little ones with the iPads and the devices and everything. How did that kid know to swipe up? The other day, well, that's because they've been watching who? Mom and dad. They didn't come out of the womb that way. Yeah, a couple Sundays ago, uh, the little ones in the nursery, Linda's reading a book to them. And you know what they're trying to do? Swipe up on the page. And she's like, no, honey, you got to turn the page. You know? <laughs> Why? Well, they don't. Because what are, what's their object wise, they're, what, they're looking at it. So events are used to teach Israel, to show them. Now, when you get into the epistles, Romans to Philemon, and then the Hebrews to Revelation, epistles are doctrine, information, more mature, more grown up -y than historical narrative, where you're painting pictures and doing this. Now we have a discourse, a conversation. And the epistles are really a teacher to a student written that way, written with the design of being able to write on it and answer questions and study it down, rather than here's just this pretty picture. So when you see this storm and you see the wind blowing and the waves raging, it's painting a picture for the little flock, for the disciples in the boat. Isaiah 57, if you look here at verse 19, I create the fruit of the lips, Peace, peace to him that is far off, and to him that is near, saith the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are, are like the troubled sea, when it cannot rest, whose water cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. So the storm, what does it represent? It represents not the peace of God's people, but the turmoil of the world. See, the, so the storm's painting a picture here. They're out there on that sea going. Sea in, uh, the sea in Scripture is usually masses of, of multitudes of peoples. Usually, most of the time, it's talking about the Gentiles. But like you read in Revelation and, and the whore that cometh up out of the sea. Well, that's not coming up out of the Mediterranean Sea, literally. It's coming up out of the nations, because that's where he's coming from. He's the Assyrian. He's coming out of Syria. So the storm here, there's no peace, the, but the wicked are like the troubled sea. So when you see that sea out there, Israel, what should register in your mind? Trouble, not peace, but rather trouble. The troubling of the world. Come over with me to Job. We're, I was reading Job. That's how I thought about Job's wife and the adversary leaving her alone. Job 1. So when it comes, here's where this trouble comes from. I was also studying Psalms 2 for the Roman study. And Psalms 2, why do the heathen rage? So there's a, there's a thought here to paint a picture so that when Israel sees that, they can go, aha, that's what we're talking about. Okay? Job 1, look at verse 18. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and thy daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And behold, there came a, notice, great wind from the wilderness, and smote the four corners of the house, and it fell upon the young men, and they are dead. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Now, notice something. What's the deal with Job? God says to Satan, have you considered my man Job? You can do anything to him but kill him. You can't kill him. So what does Satan do? Satan brings a great wind and destroys his family here, kills him. So one of the ways that Satan attacks is what does he use? A great wind, a storm. So when you see the storm, Mark, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, what are you seeing? You're seeing the adversary attacking. You're seeing him 
oppose what God's doing. What's God doing? Get to the other side, remove the strong man the, the, out of the picture. Remove the satanic adversarial captivity clutch that the, he has on Israel. Remove that. Come over to chapter 41 of Job. Job 41. So the, the pictures that are being painted here is, is, really what is, is really key, especially in Mark, because of where they're going in chapter 5. Job 41, we have verse 1 here about Leviathan. Cast thou, draw out Leviathan with a hook, or his tongue with a cord, which thou lettest down. Again, Leviathan, Isaiah 27, that's that crooked serpent, the devil. He's a sea monster. Verse 31, 41, 31. He made the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. He maketh a path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary. Do you see that thing about deep to boil in the pot? That's the sea. That's a storm. It's troubled. It's not, it's not just sitting there. So when we come back to Mark, go back there to Mark 4, that's in, actually, and really in Mark 5, if you think about Mark 5, here's this man. He's, he's inhabited by the, this unclean spirits. One's going to do the speaking for them all. That's why he's called Legion. And what do they ask, what does the man what does Legion ask him to do? He says, Don't throw us out of the land. Put us in the swine. We'll see why he says swine here in a minute. And then Mark 5, verse 13, where did the swine go? They ran off into the sea. Mark 5, 13, and forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place. Uh, down a steep place into the sea. And there were about 2,000, and they were choked in the sea. Luke 8 calls it the deep. There's a great affinity. And when we get into Matthew, Mark 5, we'll spend some time looking. The adversary, his hordes, the unclean spirits, they, they have an affinity with water and the deep and the sea. So the storm here, Mark 4, the storm is representing the satanic attack. By the way, Revelation 12, the adversary loses the war in heaven. He's cast to the, to the earth. He goes after Israel and he opens his mouth and a great what? Flood goes out. Water goes out to get Israel. So he, there's a strange thing in Scripture about Satan and his buddies, how they have this weird obsession with water and, and, and with fire. They're just drawn to it, and they're fascinated by it. And actually, if you've ever sat around a campfire, man's the same way. You're drawn to that fire, going, ooh, you know, and there you go. So Mark 4, the storm here, the disciples, the Lord, where are they going? We're going to the other side. We've got things to do over there. Satan knows that. He knows they're coming. He knows why they're coming. So what does he do? He opposes them. He raises up this storm. He opposes this little group of people who are coming over, and they're going to take back the land from his possession. And that's what's happening here in, in the storm. Verse 38, he was asleep in the hinder part of the ship, sleep on a pillow, and they awake him and say unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? Mark 4.38. Again, that's unbelief talking. He, they know he cares whether they live or die. He's already vested that in them. So that's unbelief talk. That's in the heat of the moment. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. So he rebukes the wind. He says... By the way, notice he rebukes the wind. He doesn't rebuke the adversary. He doesn't rebuke the evil spirit. He's rebuking nature now. And what we're going to see here is he's, he's, beginning, he's beginning to gonna take care of nature, relieve, get nature who's being used by the adversary to oppose what they're doing. 
He's going to come along now and he's going to liberate nature. Peace, be still. And in Israel's program, the physical elements, come back over with me to Psalms 89. The physical is, being, is often used to accomplish a spiritual end. And what's happening here is nature is being used to stop what God's do, doing, to oppose it. Psalms 89. So he rebukes the wind. So what does the wind do? Stops. What does the water do? It flattens out like a sea of glass. i got a friend on Facebook. He's up in Nova Scotia, that area of the continent. He's in Nova Scotia. That's Canada. Yeah, I, I, I was right there is Maine and all that good stuff. And he was showing me a picture. He's got a pontoon boat, so I'm highly jealous. And he was showing me a, a ride that they were on, him and his family, and the water was just, you could literally walk on it. It was just beautifully calm. That's what happened here. Peace. It's just like glass. Now, that's power. He spoke the word. Now, they're not believing his word, but yet he spoke it. And what did nature do? Nature responded. He's taken nature out of the control of the adversary. So he's completely repossessed nature. Look at Psalms 89. Psalms 89 is a psalm all about the Davidic covenant. Verse 1. I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built upon up shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shall thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servant. Thy seed will I establish forever and build up thy throne to all generations. Selah. All of that. God gave his word. What's he going to do? He's going to build a literal, physical, visible, earthly, Davidic kingdom. And the seed of David is going to sit on the throne one day. That's his word. So guess what's going to happen? That's going to happen. And the heavens will praise thy wonders, O Lord. Uh, by the way, I'll remind you that Selah, that is a pause. It's not a, necessarily a musical pause, as they all say, but it is a pause for Israel to stop a minute and think about what they just read about. Okay? What did they just read about? What is God going to do? He's going to establish that literal, physical, visible, earthly Davidic kingdom. And the seed of David is going to sit there. So they're gonna, they pause, they go, okay, I remember that. But then it's everywhere that word Selah, everywhere that word Selah shows up, it's in reference to his second coming, tribulation, the end of the 70th week, or into the millennial. So it's that part of the timeline. Well, when does he establish that kingdom, that throne, that is second coming? So there's a pause here of, hey, let's, we, we need to pay attention. Verse 6. For who in heaven can be compared unto the Lord? Now watch closely. Who among the sons of the mighty can be likened unto the Lord? So that's the angelic host, the heavenly host. God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints and to be had in reverence of all them that are about him. O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord unto thee? Or to thy faithfulness round about thee? So the heavenly congregation, that heavenly host, the angelic, no one can be compared to the Lord, to Jehovah. There's no one out there who can hold a candle to him. Now watch verse 9. Thou rulest the raging of the sea. When the waves thereof arise, thou stillest them. Now think about verse 8. O Lord God of hosts. O Lord God, Jehovah Elohim, who can do verse number 9? Thou rulest the sea, thou rulest the waves, thou take care of the wind. Who, who, only, who, only one person can do that? Jehovah. Jehovah is the only one that can do, can do that. So when Jesus Christ says, peace be still, peace be still, calm down, that's why when go back to Mark 4 real quick. You can let Psalms 89 go. Well, no, keep it for just a second. That's why in Mark 4, 
The guys say, verse 41, What manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Who is he that can do this? There's a man standing there who just said, Peace be still. Wind ceased, and there was great calm. What kind of guy, what kind of a man is this? Well, the only one that can say that, Psalms 89, 9, is Jehovah. Again, he's demonstrating himself to be Jehovah, the Most High God. And the heavenly host, back there in Psalms 89, verse 6, 7, verse 5, 6, 7, 8, no one can, can compare to him. He's demonstrating again who he is. That he, and by the way, in the Old Testament, he does it over and over again. In Jeremiah 10, he talks about the big, big God, big G, little g, the God. And how do you know the difference between the big G and the little g's? He's the creator. And you want to you be God? Then go out there and create your own dirt, create your own universe. Thing is, is you can't do that. But he can, and he's done it. So when you come back to Mark 4, when Jesus stills the earth, stills the earth, stills the sea, calms the winds down, he's demonstrating that he is the most high God. That's what he's doing. Again, he, here's the Lord using his deity attributes to demonstrate who he is. Now, he's also human, so he's got some other things, you know, not my will, but thy will be done, and so forth, and putting himself in the Philippians 2, we, when we looked at that a couple weeks ago. What's he doing? He's demonstrating his power over nature. Now, going across the water, chapter 5, he's going to demonstrate his power to deal with liberating Israel, the land of Israel, from the clutches of the adversary. And the disciples see him do that. And he's going to do something here. He's done something, calmed everything down. And what they say, verse 44, wow, who is this guy? I guess he is who he's saying he is. So he heals nature, takes it out from under the control of the adversary. But notice verse 40. He said unto them, Why are ye so fearful? How is it that ye have no faith? They didn't believe. And what he's saying to them is, is, Guys, you didn't believe my word when I told you, let's go to the other side. Now he's not talking about their eternal justification or any of that. He's talking about them, what did he say? Verse 35, we're going to the other side. And the, the, the opposition came up, and it, be, uh-oh, hey, Lord, we need your help. And he's like, no, we're going to the other side. You don't believe. So then what came in? Fear. Fear happened. Now, what's going to happen after the cross, after the resurrection, after the ascension? He leaves Acts 1. What happens in Acts 2? The opposition comes up. Acts 3. What do we do? Well, what is his word going to teach them to get through it? And they have to rely on that. So 5.1. And they come over unto the other side of the sea. And the sea there is the Sea of Galilee into the country of the Gadarenes. So they get to the other side. So he's delivered the nation. So having delivered nature from the adversary... He's now going to go deliver Israel from the clutches of the adversary. And he's going to demonstrate how that's going to all take place. He's going to demonstrate how not only did he deliver nature, but now how he's going to deliver Israel itself from the strong man, from the satanic captivity. The country of the Gadarenes, that's the northeastern side of the Sea of Galilee, so North, eastern side of Sea of Galilee. Okay, just it's it that's where it's at. Now, verse two. Now we're going to go through all the details next week in this. I just want you to see he's delivered nature from from the adversary. 
and he's going to go deliver Israel from the clutches. Okay? Verse 2. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains, because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in peace, neither could any man tame him. So we got a wild man. Okay, we got a guy driven by unclean spirits. Verse 5, And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Notice he knows who's coming. I think about that, the sorcerer there in Acts, uh, 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 and he says, uh, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? They know, he knows who's coming. He knows what's happened. So what does he say, verse 7? And cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. A couple things. First of all, he knows who's coming. He recognizes him as the Son of the Most High God. But then he says, I don't want you to torment me not. Matthew says, don't torment me before the time. He knows there's a judgment coming. Now, the guy speaking is the unclean spirit. It isn't the man. Okay? Come over to Luke 11. Look, look at Luke 11. And as we get down here, we'll see that. Luke 11. And look at verse 14. Luke 11, 14. And he was casting out a devil, and it was dumb. And it came to, Luke eleven fourteen. 14, And it came to pass when the devil was gone out, the dumb spake, and the people wondered. Now, the dumb there, that's not being stupid or ignorant. It's the, the ability of not being able to speak. Okay, verse 15. But some of them said, he cast out the devil, Devils through Beelzebub, the chief of the devils, and others tempting him, sought of him a sign from heaven. But he, was he, knowing their thoughts, said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and a house divided against a house falleth. If Satan also be divided against himself, how shall his kingdom stand? Notice how he knows he, he says Satan has a kingdom. See that? Because he say they that I cast out devils through Beelzebub. Notice that he says Satan has a kingdom, and Satan's kingdom is represented by the unclean spirits that's in the man. Verse 20. But if I, with the finger of God, cast out devils, no doubt the kingdom of God has come upon you. Matthew 12 28, he doesn't use the finger of God, he uses the Spirit of God. So the finger of God and the Spirit of God are going to be one and the same. What I want you to notice, though, is, well, verse 21, When the strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. Now, the Lord's casting out devils. Everybody says he's got a devil and he's being used by the devil. And, you know, just a silly argument. Because if, if I'm casting out devils and the devil's making me do it, then that, that, that's a house divided. But then he brings in this issue about the king, a kingdom, that Satan has a kingdom. Verse 21, the strong man has a palace and he's armed and his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, now, that's what we're going to see in Mark 5. Matthew 8, he's already shown this to him in Matthew, but we're going to see this in Mark. He taketh from him all of his armor wherein he trusted and divideth his spoil. He lost the battle. So it is necessary for Christ to cross over into the very area of the land, and we'll see this next time, 
where the stronghold of the adversary is and to literally cast out Satan out of the land, okay, and his kingdom. The strong man, Satan armed. He's got guards, armed guards. Their garden is goods, his stuff. Actually, in Revelation, when we went down through Revelation and we were studying the route of Christ and the second coming and everything, and how he comes in and he goes above Jerusalem and he liberates Jerusalem, there's like a pause there. The the Antichrist leaves and goes up into this area, regroups, and then they meet on the Battle of Armageddon. One last big battle. He literally, the Lord literally chases the Antichrist, not only out of Jerusalem, but up. And when that ha- that's where we're at here. They're his guards, they're armed, they're his he's got an army, it's protecting. And what and what they're protecting, come back to Mark 5, sorry. What they're protecting is the territory. They're protecting the stronghold. They're pro- they're trying to keep it under the satanic control. Now Christ is going to be stronger, and he's come to do what? Throw the throw them out. So that's what he's going to do here. And he's going to cast out the unclean spirit. Now, in Mark 5, you got the man here, and what does he have? He's got, well, verse, where did I look? Verse 8, for he said unto him, come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. And he asked him, what is thy name? And he answered, saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. Well, now, Legion in the handbooks, they say that number is 6,000, okay? So, Legion, a Roman army, number, numeric. So uh, you could say it's anywhere from two to 6,000, okay? So there's 6,000 unclean spirits, and they got one spokesman. That's a lot going on. Now, the reason I say that about that is the end of, in verse 13, the parenthesis is 2,000. See that number given? Okay. So you can go from 2,000 to 6,000 in there. The, the number isn't the issue. The issue is what? <laughs> there's a lot of them. The, but there's a bigger issue than that. Look at verse 10. And he besought him much that he would not send them away, notice, out of the country. You see, the unclean spirit isn't worried about getting cast out. He doesn't want to be cast out of the land. Why? Their job's to hold it. It's the control. That's the territory under Satan's control. And the unclean spirits have been out there inhabiting the Jews. And the number of the Jews for them to possess. Now, why would they possess the Jews? Because the Jews do what? They possess the land. Follow that? The Jews own the land, so then if I'm going to occupy and take over the land, then where am I going? I'm going into the Jews. Here you got a guy that's got anywhere from 2,000 to 6,000 in him. You know what's happened? The unclean spirits have outnumbered the Jews. There's no more Jews to inhabit. So we're taking resident in one guy, and he's a maniac. <laughs> so they, He's not really a maniac, but that's what they call him. Remember Daniel 9, 24? Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people. Isaiah 62, he talks about Beulah land and going in and getting the land clean and then remarrying you to the land. He can't put a dirty people in a clean land. He's got to clean the people up. Why? Because the people are inhabited with who? Unclean spirits. That's what's happening here. God has taken the land, cleaned it up. Now he's going to clean up the people, and that's what we're seeing in the picture here of him going in and dealing with this guy. Is he's going to take and he's going to clean up Israel. Now what Satan wants to do is keep Israel dirty, keep her corrupted, so then God can't use her to go and accomplish the establishment of his kingdom. The people are bad, can't do it, so we're not going to do it. So the unclean spirit, you know what he says? Don't throw me out of the land. Put me in the swine over there. Put me over there into something else. Don't throw me out of the land. He doesn't say don't throw me out of the man. 
verse 11, 511. Now there was, there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding, and all the devils besought him, saying, See, all the devils? <laughs> Send us into the swine that we may enter into them. You see, th now they're all talking. We got one guy doing the talking, I am legion, hear me roar, you know, the movie. Now you got them all saying what? Don't get, don't, no, no, put us in the pigs over there. Now there's a reason for all that. Come back to Isaiah 65. See the reason. This man's not a maniac. He's not nuts. He's just possessed by a multitude of unclean spirits that are there to corrupt him with unclean things. It's not just his flesh out there just doing stuff, but rather it's that unclean spirit causing him to do some activity here. Watch it in Isaiah 65. Again, the stuff you read about just didn't happen because it happened. There's a picture being painted for Israel. Isaiah 65, verse 2. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walk in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. All right? They've rebelled against God's word. They've rebelled against God's way of doing things. They're doing it my way. Okay? Verse 3. A people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face. Now watch, that sacrifice in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick. If they're sacrificing and they're doing incense, this isn't out fulfilling the lust of the flesh. What, what is it? It's religion. See? He's not out talking about running down and getting a beer or whatever down here at the local, you know, as Dad called them, the upholst upholstered sewers. He's not talking about that at all. I had dinner at Chili's tonight, sitting there, and they put me in the bar because there's only me, and which is fine because I can watch some of the ball game or the ESPN. It's muted, so it's even better. I can just read the ticker, you know. And they're they're sitting at the bar, and they're just a yakking about everything. I was like, geez, would you be quiet, you know? And but what? That's he's not talking about that. What's he talking about? He's talking about religion. What are they doing? They're sacrificing in gardens and burneth incense upon altars of brick. By the way, they're not supposed to be in the gardens doing that. We're talking about a spiritual corruption. Verse 4, which remain among the what? And lodged in the mountains. Where did this guy come out in Mark 5? He came out of the what? The tombs, the graves. And lodge in the mountains, which eat what? Swine's flesh. They said what? Don't put us, put us out of the land. Put us where? In the swine. Why would they say that? Because Isaiah 65 said that's where they, that, what do they want to eat? They want to eat that swine. And broth of abominable things is in their vessels. By the way, in Mark 5, the guy's cutting himself. He's sitting in the tombs, he's doing, and he's cut, cutting himself. That's that religious activity. You remember in 1 Kings 18, Elijah with the Baal, the prophets of Baal, you know, and, he's, and they sit down there and they're cutting themselves. It's all part of religion. So in Mark 5, come back there, the man is under the control, the control of, what the satanic religion, Baal worship, leads Israel to. He's a picture of it. Here's what the satanic, here's what the relig, here's what Baal worship leads you to. And he's a picture of what's going to happen, what's happening to them when they get involved with the satanic policy of evil. What it happens? They go nuts. They go mad. They fall under, they're completely under the control of the adversary. Again, it's not they're down there, you know, this guy's not, you know, roasting pork on the spit just to do it. He's doing it because 
He's got an unclean spirit making him do unclean things. So what does Christ do? He comes and he removes them. Verse 13, And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently down a steep place into the sea. <laughs> and there were about 2,000 and were choked in the sea. And they, and they that fed the swine fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they went out to see what it was that was done. What, well, what just happened? A great picture here of the Lord coming, not just to take some poor man and clean him up, but rather he's come right into the stronghold of the adversary, and he's taking away the Jews, the Israel, who's under the control of the unclean spirit, who's being held in captivity, and he's setting them free. Now, the interesting thing is, is if you drop down to verse 18, and when he was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. The guy wants to leave, but what does the Lord say? Stay, you got a job. Go tell everybody. Okay? Now, I want, again, I want to spend some time in all of this because of verse 7. What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of the Most High God? Again, the Lord is demonstrating that he is the Most High God, who's come to take back into his possession, his people, his land, his kingdom, is going to destroy the kingdom of the adversary. And there's some, a lot more things going on here I don't want to miss. Okay, what's he do? He liberates nature, and then he goes and he liberates the land, the people in the land, actually. The land's clean, by the way. It's the people that aren't, and he goes and he does that, okay? So we'll pick up back here in, in chapter 5, verse 1, but I want you to get the feel here with Mark. We got the, the sower explains how we're going to learn all the parables. He goes into the thing about the candlestick. You got information, you've got light, don't hide it, proclaim it. But right now, we're going to hide that light in mystery, parable form for now. Your job when I leave is going to be to proclaim it. We looked at that. Then he went into the mustard seed. Because when you are going to proclaim it, you're going to grow. And when you grow, you're going to grow really big. And you're going to grow really quick. There's going to be a growth process. So here you are, you're growing, and but yet we'll, we'll look at what comes up. Opposition comes. And you need to understand that opposition is coming because of what I'm doing, what we are doing together, which is establishing the kingdom that I promised back there but yet, we're, first we have to do what with the people? Clean them up. And the adversary isn't just going to bend over and say, welcome to him. He's going to resist. And when he resists, you need, to, you need to obey my word. You need to remember my word. What was my word? We're going to the other side. Don't have fear. Don't have shame. I, I'm just looking at Romans 9 for Sunday. And the potter and the potter's clay and all that, Paul brings all that in, talks about Abraham. I mean, we start in Abraham, Romans 9, Abraham. We go Abraham to Esau and Jacob. Then we go from Esau and Jacob to Moses and, and Pharaoh. And now we're Jeremiah and potter's clay. So we literally start at the Abrahamic covenant, introduce the Mosaic covenant, and end with, over here with, the, with uh, the new covenant. And when you do that, Israel should never have objected one time to Paul's ministry. They should have known. Hey, God's 
but they objected because they didn't understand. They didn't believe. They re had rejected their Messiah. They're not believing this. And that's why at the end of Romans 9, when we get down in there in about three weeks, <laughs> it feels like, well, it's just so much. And, you know, it's that he says, hey, the problem isn't God. The problem is you and unbelief. And that's really it is. And that's what's happening here. Again, not unbelief to lose their soul salvation, but unbelief in the moment and being terrified by the circumstances. Okay? Again, we'll pick up in Mark 5. We'll go run some things here more next time. But just don't read, read Matthew 8, read Luke 8, this, the story here of the, the maniac of Gadara, as they call him. And you begin to really see some of the detail. Okay? All right. Dearly Father, we thank you for the evening. We thank you for your word and for the, the ability to study it, and to fall in love with it, and to relish in it, and to rejoice in it. In your name we pray. Amen.